Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It is lovely to see you all here for the last panel of the day on the future of creativity and generative AI. So my name is Kate Crawford. I'm a professor, I'm an AI researcher, and I'm the author of the book, Atlas of AI. And I could not be more excited to be here with these two extraordinary thinkers and artists who will be sharing the discussion with you today. Before I introduce our guests, though, I'm going to give you a little bit of a setting for why generative AI is so timely and urgent at the moment. So I've been working in the space of machine learning for a long time now, and I have truly never seen anything like the last six months. We've reached a type of inflection point where models that were really quite theoretical have become real and material and are actually shifting quite quickly into almost every industry you can think of. So what is generative AI and how does it work? Well, essentially, these are what are called large transformer models that are trained on data sets the size of the internet. So you could think of every tweet, every blog post, every image or video that you might have made, every online trace is now being harvested and collected into these large training sets. And then a series of algorithms is being used to essentially trace patterns and make predictions about the next word in a sentence or the accuracy of an image. So now what you can do is you can open up a tab in your browser and you can go to Dolly or Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion and you can type in a sentence. You could say something like, I want to see Elon Musk at the bottom of the ocean reading how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> and you will get that picture. Or you could go to ChatGPT and you could say, please write me a Shakespearean sonnet about the beauty of the Pop-Tart, and you will get that. So we are at a moment where suddenly all we are really having to do is to become prompt jockeys. We ask a question, we get a response. But of course, there's a lot more to how these systems work. So essentially, we're starting to see these tools move into almost every creative field. That is illustration, publishing, news, industrial design, fashion, and of course, art. But at the same time, these tools have a series of quite serious problems, including forms of bias, of representation of how the world is shown and who is shown, and of course, a dominant American cultural and linguistic bias. These systems are moderated by low-paid click workers who are predominantly located in the global south, and these tools use an enormous amount of energy, widening AI's already significant carbon footprint. So, these tools come at a very steep cost. But the question is, do we even know how big the bill is gonna be and who is gonna pick up the check? So to try and answer some of these questions, today we're gonna be proposing what is the generative turn actually about? How will it impact the process of creativity? And how might it change art and the art market? So to answer these questions, we have Larry and Trevor. Trevor Paglin is uh, known to many of you, but he is an artist who's been working with computer vision and AI for over a decade. You can also see his work in the fair today at the Altman Siegel booth. And Larry Osai Mensa is a contemporary art curator and critic and the co-founder of Art Noir, which is a global collective that supports the work of creatives of color while catalyzing cultural equity across the arts and culture industries. So please make them welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna throw a question to both of you to kick us off. How are you currently using AI in your work? And how is it changing the sorts of things that you do? Trevor, do you want to kick us off? You want me to kick us off? Why not? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Trevor Paglin. And uh, Kate, thank you so much for moderating this. Uh, your book, The Atlas of AI, is for my money the essential guide to thinking about 
AI as it is, as well as its implications for the future. So it's, it's a huge honor to have you here. Um, how I've been using AI and generative AI. So I've been looking at computer vision for quite a long time, uh, actively working with computer vision and AI tools since the early 2010s or so, and really wanting to before that, but not having access to the tools. Like it was really around you know, maybe 2011, 12, that somebody with a computer at home could really start playing with this stuff. And even then I had to beg, borrow, and steal money to get GPUs to actually get some of it working. So, so I did um, the first generative AI project I did was between 2015 and 2016. It came out in 2017. I called them the hallucinations. And um, at that time, Dolly, you know, stable diffusion, that didn't exist. But we could see in the studio, we were reading a lot of technical literature about computer vision and AI, and we could see that this was coming. And so we kind of took a bunch of pieces from academic literature and built our, you know, a 2017 version of a stable diffusion or, or, a, or a dolly. And some of the images that you're seeing behind here, when you see images that are like creepy, ghostly, kind of twisted, those are very early examples of generative AI. Um, but in terms of the artwork that I've done, I feel like my job has really been to pick this apart to try to understand what is going on technically in terms of the generation of images and the interpretation of images. And also, I think most of us in the arts don't think about images as being in isolation. We understand that the meanings around images constantly change. We see images differently based on the context that we bring to them. And I wanted to understand what sorts of interpretive contexts were being created within a computer vision context. I, I, I think that seeing is always, has a political aspect to it, has a historical aspect, has a cultural aspect to it. And I want to understand what kind of politics are being built into technical systems. So that's, I guess, how I started working with this stuff. And we have behind us an example of this sort of hallucination. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this work? Well, so this one in particular, I've done a lot of different things, but one of the things that I've, I've, I've tried to do is recover what ideas of a human, for example, is inherent in any computer vision system or an AI system. If you want to build a facial recognition system, for example, you need to have an idea of what a face looks like, and you need to hard code that idea of a face into an algorithm. So it says, I found a face, who is it? Uh, this Im image is an example of that. So I've, I've, I've excavated those histories of uh, the figure of the human or the figure of a face and used those as inspirations to create almost a weird version of portraiture. I mean, we've done some of this work together as well. We gave a talk in Barcelona about the, the history of the figure of the human in different technical systems. So. So Larry, how are you using these tools in your work? How is it cropping up as a curator and as a critic? I think it started off subtly. <laughs> I didn't even know. Um, I have a friend who's a professor at FIU focusing on innovation. And usually when I write an essay or a text, I'm like, oh, let me send it to my professor friend for some feedback. And I think one day he just kind of got tired of doing it. He's like, you know, there's this platform called Grammarly you should probably try that. It'll edit your grammar, it'll give you suggestions. And this is something that I maybe started using two years ago. And it wasn't until you know, we started thinking about this conversation that I was like, oh wow, AI has actually been aiding me in my essays and my exhibition texts. Um, so I think it's, it's been subtle, um, but then I'm also someone who's guided by my curiosity. And so I've been playing with a lot of these different platforms and tools and putting in kind of silly keywords to see what uh, results will be generated. And really, you know, my job as a curator is, is, is to kind of observe, ask questions, be in dialogue with artists, and then try to figure out ways to kind of embrace this technology, um, but then also interrogate it and question it, right? Because I, I, earlier this week, I was talking to some colleagues, and I said, yeah, we're doing this conversation about generative AI, and I'm like, you know, I may have chat box, like write an essay. And it was interesting to see how emotional 
people got about like, no, that's ethically wrong, you know? And so right now I'm just kind of taking the temperature and seeing how the technology is evolving. And I'm hoping that, you know, in the next couple of months I'll have an opportunity to collaborate one-on-one -on -one with an artist and create an exhibition or some type of like moment for, for the public to dialogue with it, you know? But I think really just trying to make sense of the information and, and try to make it palatable to the average person. Because I think right now, if you were looking at it the last six months, you think AI was something that was invented like last year. And you know, you guys know that it's something that's kind of been building over time. But I've just kind of found it fascinating that it's part of like our mainstream conversation, you know, whether it's Microsoft investing in chat box, whether it's Google freaking out and now about to release 20, you know, new AI tools. Um, and I think it's gonna become a normal part of our day to day. So I think they've started suddenly, if anybody uses Gmail, it'll finish your sentence, right? And I don't think you've thought about how it's already kind of like, even I, I guess Siri would be an example too. Um, so it's kind of been present. And so now just like, how is it gonna continue to like expand this reach? That's it. And I think you're exactly right that it really has just been in the last six months that we've seen the shift into everyday tools. I'm, I'm really curious in this room, who here has used either ChatGPT or Dolly slash Stable Diffusion, any of these tools? Put up your hand. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, so that's that great. is an extraordinary thing to see. For people joining us online, that's probably about three quarters of the room. Um, I Put up your hand if you'd even played with anything that you'd have thought was generative AI a year ago. A couple of people, but still, I mean, this is this is a room who's in who's definitely in this particular shift. So that's fascinating to see. And so what I'd love to do is to ask you both to reflect on the biggest stakes here, and and in particular, what we are seeing is a level of simultaneity. The fact that these tools will be in everything that we touch from word processes to re-architecting search to re you know, it basically intervening in all of the cultural industries. How does that shift cultural production itself, Larry? I mean, I think, it, I think it's, it's, a lot of it is your perspective on it, right? Some people look at it as a tool. Um, other people look at it as a Google killer. Um, other folks look at it as like end of days, right? I think for me, it's definitely, you're already kind of seeing it with the companies laying off. Like, so what is, how does it change like, not only creativity, but just your day-to-day -day work, right? And I think, you know, I reflect on like social media and how social media changed, how we communicate with each other, how we share information, how we storytell. Um, and I think AI is kind of like the next phase in that. And for me, it's just more making sure that uh, there's checks and balances and guardrails without um, being so restrictive that it doesn't allow for the creativity that um, has allowed technology to kind of continue to change and evolve how we live, you know, on a day-to-day. Love this question, yeah. And and we will Um that's a great provocation of could could we imagine a day of not using social media and, and this is a great provocation. I'd just like also just to say we will definitely have Q and A at the end of today's session, so keep your questions tight. Um, but now that it's been posed what do you reckon? Could you imagine a day without social media? I'm looking behind us at one of your works, Trevor, that's literally about some of the training engines that scraped social media. Um, I guess the question is, where do you even see that you're using or becoming the product of social media? That interface has become a lot thinner. But I'm, I'm gonna put this to you now, Trevor, the politics of what's at stake in the generative turn, where do you see this actually mapping? Everywhere. <laughs> like, um, and so, um, you know, in the, the work that I've done and the collaborations that we've done, we've seen the introduction of things like computer vision, machine learning, AI technologies into ever more 
intimate parts of our everyday lives, right? Whether that is, you know, having smart watches that track your speech pattern, or, or uh, sorry, sleep patterns, and you know, send that off to a health insurance company, or increasingly smart cars that watch you drive and send that uh, information to your insurance company so they can modulate your rates in real time. Um, what we're seeing is the ability for sensors to collect information in places that were previously inaccessible, or not necessarily inaccessible, but too expensive to be worth it, right? Um, so that's, that's going away. Now that's on the kind of a collection side. On the generation side, in terms of generative AI, whether that is text, images, that sort of thing, we're going to, it's, it, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around the implications of that because I think they are so huge. Just in terms, first of all, of producing and consuming media. Um, image generation is going to eat the illustrator's lunches, right? I mean, that's already happening. You know, if your job is to draw dragons for Magic of the Gathering trading cards, you're screwed, you know, in multiple ways. <laughs> and we can talk about the multiple ways in which you're screwed. First of all, you're screwed because they're, they, the tools enable a dramatic de-skilling of that labor, right? It makes the, the cost of generating the types of images that there are uh, well-known genres for very, very low. Same with text generation, right? So we're moving, we're gonna be quickly moving to a place where the cost of writing a press release, for example, goes to basically zero, right? So it's a de-skilling of that, and um, images made by people or text written by people will be kind of couture items, probably, right? Now you, they still have to be overseen by humans; they still have to edit it, that sort of thing. But it drives it drives that baseline down. That's on the cultural production side. On the cultural consumption side, it gets even weirder, in the sense that imagine. Uh, you know, we've all seen the ways in which the Facebook news feed that's curated for your grandpa differently than it is for you is starting to generate multiple realities that are incommensurate with each other. Now, imagine that literally the article that you're reading is being generated for you by a um, chatbot based on your own metadata history. So me and Mike Light read a newspaper article. We reread a different article because it is generating, it, targeting specifically for us. It is generating images that are specifically targeting us. And it is not doing that in a vacuum. It's doing that in a way that is precisely designed to get out of you what it wants. And usually that is gonna be money. So that is gonna be either some kind of subliminal or not so subliminal forms of advertising slipped into that as well as on the other side trying to extract information about you. So I think, so we're imagine, we're moving on that, on the consumption of media side. Uh, it, I think it's gonna go even more into this upside down world of who knows what the hell shared reality is. But then my question to that, to both of you, um, obviously there's more articles coming out there, there's more information, clearly this is a informed audience. What are the things that we can do to contend with it, I guess, um, and not necessarily just be, I don't wanna say victim, but um, not be on the hamster wheel and be able to kind of have more say like you know i'm always like joking with my friends i have to be careful what i say because my pixel's going to hear it and then i'm going to get ads for like you know snow cones right i think are there ways that i guess without self-regulating ourselves that we can kind of like heighten that consciousness around what's happening and 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 expand our awareness you know whether that's as creatives or just in our day-to-day -day life I mean, I think that's a great question for you, Kate. I mean, you're really one of the world's experts in thinking about this. I mean, what's this? What do you think? Well, Larry's just given me the toughest question so far, so I'll give it a go. I mean, I think what you just described is that we are already changing our behavior to fit 
in with these systems. Like when you use ChatGPT, you are trying to coax out of it the thing that you want by changing your prompts. If you've worked with Dolly, you're like, hey, what's the right word to get the thing that I want? It is training you, you as much as you are training it. And I think that dynamic is incredibly important to what is happening to political subjectivity, that we are shifting into the priorities and the dynamics to make ourselves fit into the shape of what they want us to do. So how do we deal with it, which I think is the most important provocation? I think we've got a big fight on our hands, and I'm gonna take you back to a, a time in history that I think is the most relevant, is actually the turn of the 20th century. So in 1905, the player piano and the phonograph have just been invented, and artists are saying, this is terrible. Musicians are not gonna get paid to sing live. People will just play records, and they can just play our songs, and we'll get no money back. How do we do anything about this? The US Supreme Court says, tough luck. This is not an invasion of your copyright, so you're just going to lose the money. So what ended up happening was actually Congress passed a law that said you get a mechanical license every time I make a player piano roll, you know those rolls that kind of almost look like code, or a record. And today we call that royalties. We call it publishing royalties. Right now we don't have anything like that for artists or creatives. Now as you know, every artist's images have been ingested into these engines. And you can say, create an image in the style of Trevor Paglin, but with a little bit of Andy Warhol and a little bit of Agnes Martin thrown in, and you'll get something. It won't be very good, maybe, but you'll get something. Now, none of those artists will see a, a penny from any of that work. So I, I see us as being on the verge of an enormous cultural pressure point where ultimately legislators are gonna have to step in because at the moment industry has yet to come up with a way to recompense all of the creative minds and all of that work that has just been shifted into this gigantic blender. But now I wanna turn it back to you because at the same time as we're talking about these technologies, there's really only a handful of companies, we're talking about fewer than six companies in the world who can build generative AI at this scale. So what does it mean? that artists and creatives are now dependent on, oh, OpenAI or Google, will you give us access to the latest tool, you know, that you're, you're waiting, as you described, Trevor, just to be able to use these systems. Talk to me about the power asymmetry there. Well, I think my hope is that, particularly looking at like a product like Lenza, for example, and there have been people who've loved it and then people who've hated it, that, you know, these companies will finally kind of be reminded, because we were talking about this earlier, about Xerox and Bell Labs. There was a point where they were collaborating with artists, or artists were in residence to help create these tools. So my hope is that these six companies, because there's not 600 of them, will understand the importance of working in collaboration with creatives to kind of navigate a lot of those challenges around copyright. Like now you have Getty um, suing Stable Diffusion uh, over copyright for stock photography. But ironically, um, there's another company I was reading about that's working with um, another AI platform that escapes me right now. But they're basically, they're, I think, Shutterstock. Shutterstock and OpenAI. Yes. Yep. So Shutterstock and OpenAI, they're working in collaboration to kind of navigate some of those challenges and kind of close some of those loopholes. And so I think, you know, the sensible way is to be working in collaboration with creatives, giving them access to the tools. Because at the end of the day, data is what's gonna make these tools perform better. And like even I was reading an article today and I didn't even realize like using these different bots, you know, even though it's free, you know, you're basically giving them free information and free data, right? And so then what are strategies that can be put in place to hold them accountable um, to ensure that creatives are being properly credited, because a lot of times they just want credit. It's not even about the money, right? So properly credited, um, proper attribution, and then being a co-creator and, and, and you know utilizing these tools to create incredible art like you have through your practice. Thank you. But I, I, I think your point is, is very apt about the consolidation in these few companies and, and the, 
the dynamics of the creation of the training sets and the models is, uh, it, for people that aren't familiar with it, the way an AI model is created is basically a company like, you know, an open AI or whatever would go and scrape the internet. And just say like, I wanna take every image on the internet, every piece of text on the Im internet and just ingest that whole thing and train a model on that for text or images or what you have. So if you think about what that represents, you know, the internet represents like a huge amount of culture that has been created by millions of different kinds of people who have kind of uh, contributed to the creation of that shared culture. And the scraping of that and the modeling of that in a, in a theoretical but also in a practical sense really does signify the capture of that kind of collective culture making and the transformation of it into a product that is held in a single company, right? And so there is uh, a kind of conceptual consolidation of power, but also a very real one as well. Um, that is amplified by the fact that the creation of uh, a model is a, a huge energy undertaking and a huge dollar expenditure. These things are, you know, computers don't, they, they run on coal, you know what I mean? They run on gas. They, they, as you talk about in your book, the environmental uh, footprint of, of the creation of a model is massive and they're extremely expensive. So we're not gonna have a situation in which, you know, a kid with a GPU in their bedroom is gonna scrape the internet and build a model. It's not possible. So structurally, it is a, as a quite anti-democratic technology just by what it is literally made out of and what you need to make it work. Analogies, there might be analogies to things like nuclear power, right, where you do need an enormously powerful state in order to even have that technology. And so I, I wanna just ask you, I think, I think I can predict what you're both gonna say, but I'm curious. In some ways you could say this is just a progression of where we've already been for the last decade and maybe, just maybe, these generative models are just like another Photoshop plugin. It could be like the Photoshop moment where, okay, you can start modifying. Or is this more structural? Is this like the invention of photography, something that fundamentally shifts how we work? So I put it to you, what are we looking at? Is this really just a progression or is this actually a significant shift altogether in terms of the nature of work and creativity itself? I think it's a little bit of both because I think it doesn't just affect, you know, our work as creatives working in the arts, but it affects our day to day. You know, simple as something as simple as like ordering groceries, you know, um, I was reading something about when uh, online, like buying air for tickets online like became a thing and the kayaks of the world and like Travel agents were like freaking out, but you know, there was a reduction in the need, but you still need travel agents, right? So I think it's, sh it's gonna shift how we work. I think it's gonna, sh it's obviously gonna shift how we think. Um, I'm careful to say it's, it's, it's as avant-garde as like photography, but I think it's definitely gonna make our lives way more efficient. And th the question is at what expense? You know, so what's the opportunity cost? And I think for me, that's more the concern that, you know, when I think about recycling, I was at a conference in Qatar in October, and I was talking to a gentleman, and he was explaining to me how inefficient recycling was. You know, but when we think about kind of the general narrative that it's saving our planet, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, making the climate better. And he's like, well, technically it's not super efficient a lot of the things we think are being recycled actually aren't being, so it's like, so I say it's a little bit of both, but I'm more concerned that like, what's the opportunity cost? You right. know, whether it is a plug-in or whether it is something that really is gonna fundamentally change our life. And that, I think that's like the question that I have, you know. With that's it. And I think when we hear the term efficiency, when, it, when we're hearing about a machine, it's one thing. But when we hear efficiency, when it comes to making people more efficient, I mean, this, this takes me right back to the Industrial Revolution, like to moments where it was about squeezing different types of productivity out of human labor. So I'm, I'm gonna put the same question to you, Trevor. How, how significant is this as a shift? 
Is it a difference in scale or a difference in kind? I think it's bigger than the invention of perspective. <laughs> okay, so bigger than 1435. <laughs> no, I really do. You know, I mean, in, in, in so many different ways. Like in, in computer vision in particular, um, if we go back a little bit, the way I think about images kind of from, from my context, I think about an image as being an, an encounter with a thing, right? Um, so it's, it's a very relational thing. Images don't exist if nobody looks at them, right? Now, that, that's, there, there's a particular Western perspective to that. There's tons of images that are meant to not be seen, and they do work, and there's magic, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, but we, if we think about that in that, if we think about an image as being fundamentally a relation between an individual, a culture, a historical moment, and a thing that we create to reflect ourselves, the invention of AI and computer vision changes that. It actually takes the human out of the loop. You now can have images talking to other images, images being made by machines for other machines, and there is an interpretive logic that's built into them, but that interpretive logic is built into an algorithm, right? It's built into a machine learning system. And so we have that removal of the human, and I'm, I'm not, this is not being nostalgic for humans or whatever it is, but what is, but humans are weird and odd, and we change, you know, if we, we th and the, the meaning of images changes over time. Think about the Mona Lisa. You go look at the Mona Lisa now, it does not mean the same thing <laughs> that it meant 100 years ago, 200 years ago, what have you. So we see, we see the automation of the generation and interpretation of images. We see the, uh, the, 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 the algorithmification, I don't know what the right word would be, but the creation of algorithms that are dictating the interpretive framework of those images. And who's writing those algorithms to do what? A big company's writing them to make money, right? So that becomes the, uh, the thing that motivates not only the creation, the, the creation and the interpretation of, of images. And so that, to me, represents a, a kind of enclosure, right? To me, that is akin to the privatization of land. You know, that is akin to the privatization of railways or what have you. It re represents taking something from a kind of squishy, cultural, historical kind of sphere and the and placing that squarely within a kind of market logic and doing it in such a way that we don't see, right? Because we can't see through the eyes of the algorithm, although I've tried in performances like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to follow up on that and, and suggest that what we're seeing is almost the outsourcing of representation. So we're outsourcing to a set of generative models how to represent people, the world, uh, actions, uh, shapes. And this means a lot when you say, type in something like, show me an image of a CEO speaking to a boardroom. And what you would get if you tried the early versions of these models is just white guys in suits forever. Like, that's it. That's the only type of CEO that exists. And so what these engines have tried to do is they've actually you know, worked with AI fairness teams to try and inject different kinds of representations of people into these models. And sometimes they do this very, very weirdly. For example, if you look for images of the Civil War, occasionally you'll see you know, a woman general standing at the front, you're like, wait, what? Wait, what happened here? It's like, oh, I see what you're trying to do, but this might not have worked the way you intended. So we're seeing the recognition that these representations are highly biased and require interventions. But every one of those interventions is a political choice. So I want to ask from the perspective of artists in the art world, are there ways in which we could create different visions of the world, different visions of the human using these systems, or are we unfortunately now trapped in this outsourced vision where we're going to be told what the world looks like? Well, I think artists being artists, they're going to figure out ways to hack the system, right? So they're going to figure out ways to 
if they don't see something that's representative, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, culturally, psychographically, socially, we're talking about economics, um, they're going to figure out ways to hack the system and create those interventions, create those experiences. Um, so I'm not necessarily concerned with that because I think history has just shown that, you know, if artists see something, it's it's been their, in my view, responsibility to challenge those things, you know, and help us realize that uh, the system is rigged. The system is not considering the multitude of approaches, interests, strategies, um, and a lot of, you know, the, the learning and the algorithms that have been put in place uh, are purely, you know, thinking from a Western paradigm, you know, and not considering folks from the global south, you know, folks from Africa. Um, and so I've, I think it's an opportunity, right? I think if we, if we engage the challenge, um, it's an opportunity. And I think it also will kind of like, it'll create an, a, a check and balance. You know, so even though there are only six companies and I think we're kind of excited and elated by it, I'm sure there's an artist who's studying this and figuring out how do I break this thing? You know, and how do I ensure that, you know, my life is not restricted by the, the, the objectives, particularly monetary, um, by a few, right? And I think that's just shown itself in so many kind of facets of our, our daily life and throughout history. So I'm actually particularly excited more about that part. You know, who are the artists that are going to critique what's happening and then create alternatives for us to utilize that, you know, are more reflective of how we see the world, how we experience the world. What do you think, Trevor? Is, is a vision of a more equitable world possible with these systems or are we going to hit real limitations because of its masters? No, I mean, so I, th I think your, your, your point is right on that, like, when you just ingest the raw internet and you build a model and then you say, okay, show me a picture of a CEO. Well, we live in like a racist patriarchal society and that's what the images on the internet look like. So that's what's gonna get reproduced. So um, a company like OpenAI is smart enough to know, hey, we can't just make racist AIs even though that is the default thing that the AI is going to do. So they hire people on the back end to add manually, <laughs> you know, like, well, you know, diversity tags to things, which is how you end up with this, uh, you make me a picture of a, a general in the Civil War and you end up with a woman, right? Because on the back end, somebody is saying, somebody, they have uh, manually added the prompt, oh, if you say the word general, don't assume that it's a man, right? So th there's hijinks ensue on that side. Having said that, yeah, sure, but we can give a company like OpenAI credit for listening to people on the who are who from the humanities essentially and from the social sciences who have looked at some of these systems to be like, boy, oh boy, this is not at all just a technical system. You're doing real kind of social, social and political work when you're building these kinds of representation engines. Um, having said that, <clears throat> the idea that diversity is just more images of women in different kinds of places or more pictures of people in color in different kinds of contexts, that that's what it is, is an incredibly shallow and uh, very corporate friendly, <laughs> you know, uh, vision of diversity, right? So we can take that on one hand. Second hand, we still have to rely on the benevolence, you know, of AI modeling companies to make uh, make those kinds of images and to, to to try to think about those political issues. And ultimately, what a representation of a human is is a political gesture and or is a political act. And so, I'm when we talk about the consolidation of the AI industry in a few companies, what we're saying is we are all sort of going to grant the power to these companies to decide what diversity means in terms of visual representation on one hand. And it's not just limited to people. Be we use images to imagine possible futures. We use images to interpret the past. So we can say uh, we want 
you know, women generals or what have you, but if I say I want an image of the future of the city, should OpenAI be in charge of deciding what our imagination of the future of the city is going to be? Does it have cars in it? Does it have only Teslas in it? You know, what have you. Right? So I think there's, there's, there's many different ways in which um, we interpret reality through images and then we make the reality that we see in images or that, or that we are able to imagine with images. So I, 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 just to add another layer of complexity to the question, the diversity question here. But then how do you think as creatives or, or individuals committed to this kind of sector, do we apply pressure for accountability? When, when it comes to um, ensuring these ideas around diversity, whatever that may mean, to individuals is nuanced. Yeah. And it's not just checking a box. You know, because I always think about like, you know, Jeff Chang wrote in his book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, talking about um, diversity being co-opted by corporate America, right? And through that co-opting, um, it's, it's been flattened, right? And it doesn't have the rigor. And so I always wonder like, you know, what can we do as the people, because we're the ones providing the data to hold you know, these companies ac accountable through the process, you know, uh, particularly as, you know, again, as creatives. And I think that's what we naturally do in some shape or form, whether it's creatives, activists, thinkers, scholars, you know, so that's something that I'm, I'm constantly thinking about and wondering. Well, that seems like a perfect opportunity to open up to your questions on the floor. Um, we have a roving microphone, um, so please put up your hand really high so we can see you. And we would love to have your questions for the panelists. Hi, up the front. Hi, thank you so much for, for your thoughts today. I wanted to go back to an earlier point about uh, specifically the curation of this information that this was a scraping of the internet and so it was a wholesale theft of the labor of millions of artists around the world and that art represents a particularly sexist, you know, classist view of the world that in those generative tools produce highly sexualized, almost pornographic versions of reality. And so given how toxic uh, and, and unethical these systems have been, I, I, my question to you is, how do we move forward with a process in which we demand an ethically sourcing of data, an ethical sourcing of images to produce generative systems that better reflect fairer versions of reality? Or should we take the wholesale costs of these tools and realize, make a choice that this is the categorically the wrong question. We should refuse generative AI altogether because that extra click or that plugin for your Google Docs is not worth the, the wholesale burning of our society? Wow, fantastic question. Um, I hope everyone heard that. Yes, we heard it good. Um, what have you got? Do we reject this? Or is such a thing as ethically sourced generative AI even possible? Well, I'll refer to conversations we've had and things that you've written about in your book, which is that you need data at this scale to build those kinds of models. And so this is where we get into like the structural politics of some of the systems. Like if you are going to have an, a, a chat GPT type model or you're gonna have a stable diffusion type of model, the only way that you can build that model is by literally ingesting you know, billions, trillions of images. That's what makes it work. So, the, so what I think is, is really super poignant about your question is, is it possible to have this kind of technology and have ethical data collection practices? And right now the answer is absolutely no, right? Because if we said, okay, we need to have the consent of every person's face who is gonna be ingested into a model, it would be so expensive to, to get that consent that you'd never be able to build the model in the first place. And so I think you're pointing out something really, really important, which is the question about whether or not these things are structurally um, unethical. And, and this is something you obviously thought a lot more about than I have, Kate. And I think you're gonna have a, a portion of our community, our society, who, who is gonna reject it. I mean, I think you see that, you know, you know, something as simple as social media, you're seeing that, where people are choosing to get off, you know, Instagram because of, you know, the mental health implications of it. 
Um, so I think you'll see a quotient of rejection. I think you'll see a quotient of people who won't care. Um, you'll see a quotient of companies that won't care. Um, so I think it's, it's going to take really a combination of strategies and really putting these companies' feet to the fire, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, there's already what exists, but, you know, without our participation, without our consent, you know, it's not going to continue to get the data it needs to kind of improve and learn better. So in that, it's like, okay, well, then if you need me in order for this thing to work, what are the terms and conditions that we can kind of put in place? I mean, I think that's conceptual and probably altruistic, but I think as a collective, it's something that's very possible. Um, but I think keep bringing these questions up, you know, and, 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 and making them pertinent, I think, is a, another way. Because I look at, like, we were talking earlier about what Google's doing, and I know Sundar's attempting to do it. I don't know if that's reality or lip service, but I think they understand the pressure that they're under um, and the scrutiny that they'll be under if they don't get it right. Thanks. A question, yeah? Yeah, from I have Thanks. a question you had mentioned earlier about writing a press release. Yeah. I've been reading recently, what happens to applications to Harvard and Yale and by people who may not even graduate high school or submissions for stories or, but more concerning about even the press, you know, are there going to be watchdogs or what does a watchdog have to look like when there's a committee of applications saying, we can accept three people, we have 25 essays, who wrote the right essay? And it was ChatGPT. So how do we, how, it, it's, it's like, how do we separate the person that's toiling over truth in an essay to get into a school or a workshop or a program or a residency to somebody that just puts 17 words into a box and has this brilliant response and gets accepted? I love this question because speaking as an academic, I can assure you that almost every university right now is having a gigantic panic attack because they are premised on a 500-year-old model of how you vet applicants, how you run assessment, even what the learning environment is premised on. So I think you've, you've hit on an absolute source of enormous anxiety. It's another industry, just like the art world, that is facing a very significant shift without really being prepared. But you've poised another question that I want to put to our panelists, which is really important. Is a watchdog even possible with deep neural nets where even the designers who make these don't know half the time why they produce the results they produce. What, what would a watchdog even look like in this context? I I don't know, but I know it's coming. It always, it always comes in some shape or form. And hopefully it's not going to be the result of something catastrophic. Uh, but usually that's the case, something catastrophic happens. I think about FTX and what that's going to do in terms of regulation around crypto and Web3. Um, but also it's, and also I, I look at what's happening just with Facebook and, and these companies already around privacy policy. Um, so I, th I think it's early days for that, but I think at some point it's, it's going to come because I think you know, we need to be protected in some shape or form. The assumption is that the government will do that. The jury's out on that. That's quite an assumption. <laughs> but I think also you're going to have you're going to have activists who are, who really understand the importance of holding these companies accountable and not letting them kind of just run wild and free. So I think it's it's going to be the people. It's going to be activists. It's going to be nonprofit organizations. It's going to be artists first before you see kind of like any type of government regulation. I mean, they're normally late to the party, but you will see it at some point. Well, my, my joke answer is I think we can have a law that says every AI has to sound like a Cylon, you know, with a vocoder. It's like very weird, weird. I am. <laughs> um, uh, it's a really hard question. It's a really hard question. I don't 
my intuition is that we look back towards the data set curation and the data set collection, right? And thinking about what are you, what types of media are you allowed to use in the creation of the models, right? What are the terms and conditions around that? And that can be really hard because a lot of the data sets themselves are proprietary. You know, like Facebook can make a, a text data set and not say where they got the text that they're using to train the model. And I, I don't know the answer to the question, but I think about what are the different moments in the creation of the, um, of the AI models and thinking about what are the places in which we could uh, make interventions or have watermarking or whatever it is. What do you think, Kate? I have to say, looking at what we've already been through in terms of the inability to regulate social media in the last six years doesn't, doesn't give me a lot of hope because this is going to be a lot harder to get into. Um, some ray of light on the horizon is that uh, the EU has just formulated the first ever omnibus AI regulatory bill, which will be coming into effect presumably sometime this year. They are trying to wrap their heads around this, but of course this entire piece of legislation was written before this generative turn happened. So we already have a lag time of new legislation not keeping up with a very significant change, which I happen to think is certainly one of the biggest that I've seen in my lifetime since the creation of the web. I mean, I'm having that moment right now where I'm like, I really think this is a big one and it's gonna present enormous problems for regulators and for policymakers, not to mention labor organizers, not to mention people who are actually fighting for the rights of artists to have their work protected. But we all have a stake in this change, but we don't yet have the language or the mechanisms to have that type of accountability yet but I love this question. We have time for a final question and then unfortunately we're gonna have to end, but the upside is we will have a book signing outside and drinks, so there's, there are some good things coming, I assure you. Um, one question up the back here. Um, yes, thank you, that's the woman so, in the gray jumper. Yeah, yeah. so um, you're talking about fairness and you know hoping that there is a fairness going forward and as the internet is being scraped, what about, the, and I assume these six countries you're talking about are probably in the US or in the West, what happens going forward when this technology is in countries where they, where it's a closed internet system and where that information then is fed back in a sense as using it as a, as a further amount of social control? And so do, do you see the possibilities of generative AI as being uh, capable of instituting more social control in countries that are trying to uh, enact that? And also, is it possible that, you know, going forward, you see these great divisions in how we um, go, go forward in how we vision reality because our internet's being fed back to us as reality and somebody else's closed internet system is being fed back to them? A fantastic final question to end. I put this to the panelists. How does this work in authoritarian states, which as you say are absolutely among some of the countries who have the power to create large-scale generative AI? What does that do to the ability to have increased social control and in particular to have these reality fractures that you're describing where you could have such a different view of the world just because your media is so now completely controlled in ways that an authoritarian state couldn't have dreamt of 10 years ago? I, th I think it creates a challenge. I mean, I think about you know the time I spent in China and you know I'll do a basic web search on something that like is normal here and it doesn't appear, right? Um, but I think that's my faith, but then I have my faith in human beings where like there's so many alternative ways of getting information, whether you're in China, I think Cuba is another great example where like access to information, there are these attempts, you know, from a governmental uh, level of reducing that and people have just figured out other ways to hack the system. So I think you will see these attempts to kind of regulate access to information. You know, fake news is another kind of concern. But I think you're also going to have individuals who want the truth. Um, they want, you know, accuracy and accountability. And, you know, I've mentioned this before. They're going to figure out ways to hack the system. So you might have kind of like, I'm curious, like pirate, you know, AI platforms that people will be utilizing. Um, 
But then when I when I think about the question, it makes me think about like things like Hunger Games, right? And like the reality versus like the kind of perceived reality. Um, but I have faith in human beings that they're gonna they're gonna hold not only the companies to to the fire, but they're gonna hold the tools to the fire. Um, and that's just something that we've done historically, you know. And so my hope is that we're not. Uh, we don't become zombies and, and become uh, slaves to the, uh, the artificial intelligence. But Any last words, Trevor? It, it take a while. <laughs> like, uh, um, the, the, my first instinct is to separate out data collection and kind of more analytic-based AI from the generative stuff. So when we're talking about generative, we're talking about the generation of text and images and that sort of thing. So we certainly see the analytical and the extraction side as being absolutely um, useful to authoritarian regimes. It's, it, in general, it's just really useful to power, to who's in power, right? So it's really useful to authoritarian regimes when that is really what is the locus of power in that society. In a society like ours, where the locus of power is really about pillage and kind of like hardcore predatory capitalism, that's the kind of sector that it is, is, is tremendously empowered by those same kinds of tools, right? <clears throat> That's on that extractive side. On the generative side, it's a really interesting question. And, and I, can, I can think a lot about how the generative side, the generation of images and text and culture, um, operates in an American kind of context. But I haven't thought deeply about what the generation of culture would look like as a coercive mechanism in an authoritarian or more despotic type society. What do you think, Kate? I'd actually be really interested in your thoughts on that specific question. Well, we're at the end, so I wanna, I wanna leave you with at least a, a, a moment that says, I think the next two years is gonna be giving you an answer to this question, whether we like it or not. I think we're about to get a lot of empirical evidence about what happens when these tools are deployed in very different cultural contexts. And my hope is that Larry is right and that we will see a particular type of resistance, perhaps even an outright rejection of some of these systems. But my fear is that you're shifting what it is to be human itself. You're shifting our understanding of ourselves and our societies. And at that level, I think these tools are far more powerful than we even realize at this very early stage. But what I will say is that we're about to find out very soon. So on that note, <laughs> hopefully we can find some optimism together. There will be a book signing outside. Come and say hi. Continue the conversation. And please thank, thank our guests. Thank you.